excited to jump into the video that you're about to see. But before I do that, I have something very important that I have to do. And that is, I have to tell you about this video's sponsor. However, it's really late and I'm very tired and I am going to Japan very soon and I still have a lot of packing to do. So I thought to myself, I thought, what is the laziest way that I can do this into the AM sponsored integration? And then it struck me, I'll let the AI do it for me. I'll just get ChatGPT to write me an integration script. And so that's what I've done. And the script, the integration that you are about to witness was written entirely by ChatGPT. The prompt I gave it was, write a script for a two minute video integration on the ASMR Nerds YouTube channel for Into the AM, a seller of quality graphic t-shirts and apparel. Let's see how it did. Intro music fades in. Camera fades in to show the ASMR nerd sitting at a cozy desk setup with soft lighting and ASMR props in the background. The ASMR nerd, that's me, whispering. Hey there, ASMR lovers. Welcome back to the ASMR Nerd channel. Today, we have a special treat for you. We're partnering with Into the AM, a fantastic seller of quality graphic t-shirts and apparel to bring you some relaxing sounds and showcase their amazing collection. Camera cuts to a close-up shot of a selection of Into the AM t-shirts on a table. Now, I am far too lazy to um, record that b-roll, so I'm just going to slap in some of the stock, uh, you know, footage, the, the stock assets that they give me to show you. Um, the ASMR nerd is softly tapping on a t-shirt. Just listen to that satisfying fabric sound. Into the AM uses high quality materials, making their t-shirts super comfortable to wear. Ain't no lie. Camera transitions to the ASMR nerd wearing an Into the AM t-shirt, gently brushing the fabric. The designs are out of this world. From vibrant galaxies to intricate mandalas, there's something for everyone's taste. These teeth are perfect for expressing your unique style. Camera cuts to a close-up shot of an Into the AM hoodie. An Into the AM hoodie. The ASMR nerd softly scratching the hoodie. But it's not just t-shirts they offer. Check out this super soft hoodie. It's perfect for those cozy evenings or for staying warm during gaming sessions. Camera transitions to the ASMR nerd wearing the Into the AM hoodie, gently zipping and unzipping it. Um, this, this hoodie has no zipper, so I can't do that. Uh, but if I could, I would say, whispering, and listen to that smooth zipper sound. It's like music to my ears. Plus, the hoodie has a convenient front pocket for all your essentials. That is true. It does have a convenient front pocket for all your essentials. The ASMR nerd whispering. So, whether you're looking for a comfortable t-shirt or a warm hoodie, Make sure to check out Into the AM. They have an incredible variety of designs that will make you stand out from the crowd. Camera cuts to the ASMR nerd holding up an Into the AM graphic t-shirt. ASMR nerd whispering. And 
guess what? We've got a special offer for all of you. Use the discount code ASMRNERD at checkout to get 10% off your purchase. Just click on the link in the video description to start shopping. Camera fades to black. The ASMR Nerd softly. believe the 
screenshots that we were seeing in the pre-release uh, coverage, where it just seemed like such a monumental step over what came before, and for me, and for some of you, at least some of the folks in the chat there, The Elder Scrolls for Oblivion was that game. Um, I remember seeing the first screenshots of this game. I remember to this day what some of them looked like, you know, the general framing and subjects and whatnot, because uh, I think they're etched into my mind. I spent so, so, so long just gazing at those screenshots, unable to comprehend how a game could look that good. Um, the smoothness of everything really got me. Like, you couldn't see the polygons, or at least by 2005 standards, you couldn't see the polygons. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was just so pretty. The foliage looked so dense, so lush. So, I actually haven't looked inside this issue, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that some of those screenshots that I recall so fondly are going to be in this issue, and I guess we can see, I can let you know uh, if they, you know, stand up after all these years, or if it's just the rose-tinted glasses, and if they, you know, what they, um, the uh, advantage of, of hindsight, uh, it'll be interesting to see what I think of them, because <laughs> a lot of the time you go back to those old games, or go through, look at those old screenshots, and you're like, oh my god, I swear it looked better than this, like, I swear it looked amazing, but, you know, um, time makes fools of us all, right, so, so, um, of course, there are other games in here. We have a Splinter Cell Chaos Theory uh, exclusive super test. It says, are we ever going to see another Splinter Cell game? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Ubisoft sitting on that one. Uh, as well as the 11th Annual PC Gamer Awards, Champions Crowned and Gems Uncovered. Uh, the olden days of print media like this were were great, um, and these sort of, you know, annual awards and top 100 lists and whatnot were often the bread and butter of these magazines, and, uh, but they were great because there was not nearly so much online content and discourse, um, about games or, um, you know, how the relative rankings of games and stuff, I mean, that stuff did still exist, of course, by 2005, but, um, you know, still, we were in a world transitioning from print media into predominantly digital online stuff, so. It says here, the amazing sequel to Morrowind, page 54. The amazing sequel to Morrowind, indeed. Indeed, the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion get the full story on the future of RPGs. And, and I mean, they weren't wrong. Right, Oblivion went on to be extremely successful and set the stage for Skyrim being the unbelievable um, success that it was. With, you know, I think well over 30 million copies sold uh, by now, so it was the future. Plus MMO customer service nightmares. <laughs> oh dear. Let's, uh, let's dive in. Let's see what we got here. Oh, speaking of MMOs, the very first thing is a full-page ad for, well, really, it's for NVIDIA, but also for WoW. Um, WoW, of course, would have come out in, what, 2003, I guess, or 2004. I should really know that, but I didn't play it, so I don't know. Um, but NVIDIA GPUs, the official GPU of World of Warcraft. <laughs> no, I prefer Jaggies. This was the area where anti-aliasing was becoming commonplace, mainstream. Um, certainly in the in the 90s, we just dealt with our Jaggies, but the early 2000s saw the advent of multi-sampling anti-aliasing, MSAA, becoming a common graphical setting in games. Um, and so NVIDIA here is trying to sell its image quality. Oh god, this is so corny, hold on. 
just have to show you this. Don't know what that is. A crumb. An ancient cracker crumb. Um, it says here, insist on NVIDIA. Insist. I wonder what NVIDIA was valued at in 2005 compared to what it's valued at today. It was not, not the juggernaut that it is today. At this point in 2005, March 2005, I would have been gaming on, I'm just trying to think of my GPU, it would have been a ATI Radeon 9600 XT is what I would have had uh, from Sapphire, which was the first GPU I ever bought with my own money. Um, that thing was fast. That was such an upgrade from my old NVIDIA Riva TNT2, which we were running before that. I didn't have my own PC at the time. I would play on the family PC, but I bought that GPU, the, the Radeon card, uh, and put it in our family PC because I really wanted more frames, more FPS. Shortly after this, I got my own PC, my first PC, and in that thing, I had a Radeon X800 XL, which was a hell of a card at the time. Um, but what do we got here? Oh, the Lord of the Rings Battle for Middle Earth. Uh, that was a good one. That was a very cool RTS, back from when RTSs were still, you know, relevant. Um, but this was a, a really fun Lord of the Rings one. Of course, this was sort of in that era where there was a lot of Lord of the Rings movie spin-off games because they were just coming in around then. I guess Return of the King was what, 03? Is that right? Um, <laughs> I hope some of you guys find this nostalgic, by the way. I, I know, well, you know, some of you probably weren't born when this magazine came out. Um, or, you know, when Lord of the Rings was coming out. Uh, but I, I suspect some of you were, and hopefully this brings back some good memories. Uh, but for those of you who did not exist or were too young to really remember this time, I hope this is a really fun look into this period of, of gaming, specifically on PC, but gaming in general. It was a different time. Um, so we've got the PCG Awards, The Elder Scrolls Oblivion, Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, City of Heroes, which was a superhero MMO, On the CD, of course back then games came with demo, or magazines I should say, came with demo discs, demo CDs, packed full of game demos and wallpapers and trailers and stuff around 2005. You know, I want to say a lot of that stuff was moving online, but still, uh, like, we didn't have YouTube, I don't think, at that time. I think it was still Google Video at that time. Um, and, you know, stuff like trailers, like, you just wouldn't really stream that much anyway. I guess, like, uh, games, or websites like GameSpot and IGN had their own embedded video players, or you could download, um, stuff to watch it, but, yeah, it was in that, that awkward transitional phase. All the various sections here. Reviews over here with a, a very scantily clad lady. <laughs> um, I don't know what game she is from, but, uh, I suspect we'll find out. I'm looking through the list here, trying to figure it out. And I don't know off the top of my head. It's the uh, inverse law of female armor um, in action there. Um, and this is the letter from the editor, who was uh, one Dan Morris at the time. I don't know what he went on to do in his career if he's still in games media or not. But um, he's talking about uh, Oblivion, reflecting on Morrowind and all that sort of stuff. Star Wars 
Republic Commando, you guys. This was um, a, a heck of a Star Wars game that I actually did not play at the time. I came to this game quite a few years later, um, but I enjoyed it a lot. Um, it was, uh, I was more of a Jedi Knight series kind of guy, um, but Republic Commando surprised me with, with how enjoyable it was. It did have that, like, early console game shooter kind of uh, clunkiness to it, I guess. Um, but the squad based combat was actually pretty fun. Gosh, there's so many ads. It's like pages of ads. Although, I have to say, in retrospect now, looking back on some of these ads is just as fun as looking at the features and articles. Here we've got an Alienware ad. This was from before they were acquired by Dell. Where they actually had some credibility. Project Snowblind. I don't remember this game at all. I suspect it didn't make much of a splash, but... Huh. The Future of War, says Game Informer. All right, DI, whatever you say. It was an IDOS published game. Did any of you ever play this? I guess I didn't. We have letters to the magazine here. People would send in letters. I suspect these are emails at this, by this point. Not handwritten letters, but... Some really fun stuff in there, some pretty goofy stuff. An ad for Half Life here. Half Life 2, pardon me. Half Life 2, of course, came out in 2004. I don't remember what time of year, but I do remember that I got it for Christmas 2004 from my grandparents. So that would have been not too long before this magazine came out. The best game ever made, says PC Gamer. Nothing will ever be the same, says Game Informer. Those are some pretty solid box quotes. Like, that's pretty definitive. Um, and once again, they were actually right. Like, Half-Life 2 changed the landscape of gaming. Um, and certainly, even beyond the game itself, the Source engine uh, contributed so much to gaming in the coming years, more than anyone could have imagined at the time, I think. And that is actually not the largest achievement of uh, Half-Life 2. Um, Steam might have been the biggest uh, sea change that came with Half-Life 2. I don't know if Steam existed before Half-Life 2, but I remember the first time I ever installed it was for Half-Life 2. It came with the, you had to install the Steam client to install the game. And at the time, I thought it was stupid. I was like, why do I need this dumb extra piece of software? It was kind of pointless at the time, but none of us could have imagined what Steam was going to grow into, what it would become. And it took a long time for it to get there. Um, you know, for a long time, it was kind of just a launcher and social space for Valve's games. But... Uh, it didn't really come into its own as a, a, pla a digital storefront, the de facto digital storefront for PC games until, you know, the late aughties, um, 08, 09, somewhere in there probably, 2010 even. That's when it really took off, at least in my memory. Brothers in Arms. This is a series that I guess just kind of disappeared, but for a while there it was a really popular uh, squad based um, World War II shooter. And um, quite acclaimed, critically acclaimed. I never played it, but people seem to like it a lot. Okay, excuse me, what is this? Ah, The Sims 2, sure. What are your plans for college? Apparently, playing with little people in a book. Or on your PC. 
Spacey, I guess. This was the Sims 2 University expansion pack. Turns out that EA has been, you know, using the same business model for like 20 years now for the Sims. Uh, you know, cranking out so many little DLCs for, uh, for the base game, nickel and diming everyone that way. of war, direct action, another one of those generic war games that uh, I don't remember because I never played it, but it looks like a Tom Clancy game, doesn't it? But I don't think it was because uh, uh, didn't Ubisoft buy the rights to Tom Clancy's Clancyverse? Although maybe this was before that, because I thought Act of War was a Clancy thing. I don't know. City of Heroes. That's an MMO that I'd never played, but I know many people have fond memories of. It was a superhero MMO. It ran for quite a few years, I believe. Here we've got the incoming section. Games that are coming up, I guess. Lego Star Wars, an enduring classic. I played that on my Wii, actually. Great game. Restricted area. No idea what that is. No memory of that. Stolen, similarly. No memory of that. Doom 3, though. I certainly have memory of that. Uh, that game was definitely one of those games that you could not believe the graphics when you saw it. In fact, I I remember a cover for, for PC Gamer Magazine uh, that I think it was like, a, it was like the Doom guy and then, sort of in the shadow behind him, I think it was a cyber demon. I could be wrong. I think it was a cyber demon. Um, and it looked like it was rendered, like pre-rendered. But in small text down at the bottom of the page, it said uh, something like, this is an in-game screenshot. And that just blew my mind so much at the time, because this game was crazy looking for its time. The lighting was unlike anything we had ever seen before. And for a good year or two there, it was a very common, like, um, tech demo kind of uh, performance test and, uh, you know, graphics showcase. I remember it must have been probably, probably in 2005, or, yeah, I'm not sure, but probably. Um, sitting in a, in a friend's uh, bedroom because he had, had it fired up on his PC and it was the first time seeing it running and uh, just being blown away. Eventually I, I got the game myself, of course, and uh, it was a favorite of mine to show off my new PC, which I got several months after this, uh, this issue of PC Gamer came out. Um, that With that X800XL uh, showing off my my Doom 3 high frames, all the anti-aliasing, with well, my surround sound system, that was rad. I had the rear speakers, the 5.1 surround, and like, the monsters behind you, oh my god. That was actually terrifying sometimes. I remember cranking up the volume super loud, I had my subwoofer with the bass turned all the way up, and I'd be like firing off the machine gun, and I'm sure my parents were just like, Oh my god, <laughs> what are you doing? Just stop. Turn down the volume. It's like shaking the house with it probably. They were they were patient. They were very tolerant parents. Pariah. Another mid two thousands muddy grey and green looking nondescript man shoot <laughs> military FPS this looks kind of sci-fi actually that I don't remember very much I remember the name but I don't remember anything about it beyond that and uh, I guess it never really went on to amount to much Battlefield 2 though I remember that that was a big deal back in the day very cool First to fight, close combat, first to fight. So many of these, these military themed shooters. It was a really 
really big thing at that time, just countless military shooters, all various shades of brown and gray and green, touting, you know, whatever level of, like, hyper-realism. Um, and so few of them actually really made any impact, but... This is another one I don't remember at all, but here's based on a training tool developed for the United States Marines, it says down here. I was not so much into those kinds of games, so I, I really don't remember many of them. Now what is this? Oh, MMO. Uh, customer support nightmares. This was this Star Wars Galaxies. It's definitely Star Wars something because there's an X Wing there. Um, I don't know what's going on here, but this looks like some Spring Breakers kind of stuff. Oh, the guy game. The guy game. Oh, that was a notorious one, uh, which I never played, but I remember it being uh, sort of notoriously seedy. It says here. Uh, one of the stars of the ga of Gatherings, the guy game, has filed suit against everyone involved in the game's production and distribution, including Microsoft and Sony, to stop distribution of the game. The woman who posed topless for the game says she was 17 years old when it was videotaped. What? <laughs> Did they not do their like their due diligence to make sure they were not showcasing? Nude miners in their game. What the hell, guys? Uh, besides conceivably making the game kitty porn, this suit alleges that any consent forms the woman signed to allow her image to be sold in the game are invalid. Holy smokes. Wow. Uh, maybe that's why it was so infamous. I, I honestly don't know if that was the major controversy or not, but it probably should have been. <laughs> I hope she, uh, won her case. That's, uh, pretty gross. Yikes. Um, hey, the Doom first person movie. Yo, okay, so this game, or this movie was actually not so bad. Um, Carl Urban. Carl Urban was in that film. I saw that film in theaters <laughs> twice, shamefully. Actually, not because I loved it that much, just because, I don't know, for some reason, I ended up going with two groups of friends on separate occasions. Um, and it wasn't a good movie by any stretch, like, don't get me wrong, but it had Carl Urban, it had The Rock, and it had a first-person shooter sequence. And that was enough for me to enjoy it. So, I bet you if I went back and watched it again, I might feel differently about it. But it was campy. It was stupid. But it was it was pretty fun from what I remember. This is uh, DJ Stapleton, DJ's release meter. I believe, I believe that he is currently like the head dude over at um, IGN. Maybe not the head dude, but like he's one of the upper, you know, senior editors, I guess, there. I swear I've seen his name attached to stuff. I'm pretty sure IGN uh, in recent years. Um, Empire Earth 2, fantastic game. I really enjoyed Empire Earth 1. And then when 2 came out, I enjoyed that as well. Although, they did change it out quite a bit for 2, but in good ways, I think. And uh, that was also quite critically acclaimed upon release. The Punisher game. This one was infamous as well for being extremely violent. Uh, like, messed up, as you can see. Featured right here. Uh, a drill press uh, going into this guy's head. Um, I never played it, but I remember watching a compilation of gruesome deaths from this game uh, on YouTube like a bunch of years back, and yeah, it was messed up. It was, it was deeply messed up. 
defense came out of reputation. Guns don't kill people. Three quarter inch holes in the head kill people. So edgy. Oh boy. This was of course before the Marvel Cinematic Universe um, had kicked off. So, you know, Marvel stuff was not the family friendly, you know, mainstream oriented content uh, that it that it is now. The 11th Annual PC Gamer Awards. Let's see what they were awarding in 2005. Half-Life 2 Game of the Year 2004. Natch. It would be. With an unerring attention to the most minute details, with riveting action sequences, with exceptional voice acting and character animations, and with an enigmatic storyline that leaves you demanding a young life three. Rip. <laughs> F's in the chat. Oh man, that hurts. That hurts. That hurts. It's me right here. I mean, we did get the Half Life episodes, but, uh,. Crikey. Man, we're never gonna see Half-Life 3. It's it's literally never gonna happen and it kills me. Um this is one of those very few sequels that leapfrogs past the original in every way. Ugh brutal. Um yeah, it was a it was a remarkable game at the time. I remember um being in high school, I was in part of the uh, the IT club, basically the nerds, and um, or I shouldn't say I actually wasn't part of the club, but I just hung out with them because they were my friends, and I was I was a nerd, and uh, they had access to all the cool computer stuff, and uh, I remember at one point they pulled me into the IT lab there, and they had a leak of Half-Life 2. This was before it came out, um, because I seem to remember it leaked in advance of its release, and that was a big controversy. Anyway, one of those nerds got their hands on a copy, and, uh, we were playing it on one of the school PCs there, and it was the first time I had ever seen physics like that in a game. The ability to, you know, manipulate stuff with a gravity gun, um, to, you know, break boards, and to, like, stack cinder blocks to like solve puzzles and things um yeah it was groundbreaking that games just weren't doing that at that time it was one of the first if not the first to do that in a major way so that on its own made the game feel incredibly fresh and new um never mind you know the um characters and the, the story and all that Best Action Game 2004, the original Far Cry. This was, of course, before Ubisoft acquired the rights to that name, and this was when Crytek was publishing and developing uh, those games. Crytek, of course, would go on to create Crisis, and Crisis became Crytek's kind of equivalent thing going forward, but the original um, Far Cry was actually really cool. Um, it had this beautiful, lush jungle, uh, like tropical island uh, environment, and uh, I remember playing the PC Gamer demo disc version of that game and play, being really impressed with like the vegetation and and um, how um, beautiful those environments were. The water and the vegetation really stood out to me. Best RPG of 2004, they gave to Sacred. Now that's an interesting one. I played a bit of Sacred back in the day. It never really caught me. It was an action RPG very much in the vein of Diablo or, um, you know, Divine Divinity and that sort of thing. Um, but, um... Uh, for whatever reason, I just never really got into Sacred. Again, I, I played a little bit of it, but it, it just didn't grab me. Maybe that's one I should go revisit. If it's PC Gamer's best RPG of 2004, it can't be that bad. <laughs> uh, we also have some other staff favorites here. Full Spectrum Warrior, that was a military man shoot. The Suffering, don't remember. 
for that one. City of Heroes. Sid Meier's Pirates. Never played it, but a classic, I believe. And Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, which came out around this time, and still to this day, as I understand it, receives a lot of love and support from modders and the community. Pretty cool. Kodor 2. Shamefully, I never played Kodor 2. Kodor 1, hell of a game, but for whatever reason, I never played Kodor 2. That's another one I really should go revisit, uh, because... Uh, evidently it was exceptionally good. I remember my, my little brother playing through it, and he really loved it. Best RTS, Rome Total War. Fantastic RTS. Might be my favorite Total War game to this day. Um, it's an absolute classic. Uh, I just love the setting. Uh, it was balanced really well. I thought it was balanced really well. Like, it just... It was just really good. <laughs> it was a really good one of those. Um, and the music kicked ass. Uh, the music was done by Jeff Van Dyke, um, who has gone on to score a lot of um, indie stuff. But um, before that, he did the music for Need for Speed 2. And, or some of the music, anyway, alongside um, Osaki oh, Kaskas and um, Rom DePrisco and a bunch of other guys. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, legend, Jeff Van Dyke, absolute legend uh, in video game music. Best turn-based strategy, The Silent Storm. I did not play it. I remember, I remember people liking it, but I did not play it. Other staff picks, NHL Eastside Manager, all right. City of Heroes, Rise of Nations, Thrones and Patriots. That's a series that maybe is due for some kind of resurgence or re reboot. I don't know. Um, very popular back in the day, a quirky kind of RTS. It was a little weird to wrap my head around that game uh, coming from like Age of Empires, but it was pretty cool from what I remember. Half-Life 2, and WoW, of course. Um, best Sim. Oh, Isle 2, Stermovic. Yeah, a really popular series of um, uh, World War II uh, aerial combat games. Uh, best Racing Game, Richard Burns Rally. Okay, never played it. <laughs> best Sports Game, Tiger Woods 05. Tiger's still at it. Best multiplayer game, Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow. Fascinating. Fascinating pick. Best expansion pack, Call of Duty United Offensive. This was long before COD became the juggernaut that it is today. Um, this was when it was still a, a World War II game. Uh, this would have, I guess, been an expansion for its very first release for the original COD. Um, but people liked it back then, but it was not the, the, you know, go-to multiplayer game, uh, FPS that it is today. Best MMO, World of Warcraft, naturally. Um, okay, World of Warcraft, it, WoW did come out in 2004. Late November, evidently. I don't know why I thought it was 03. Um, but... There it is. Best adventure game, Bad Mojo Redux. No idea what that is. I was never much of an adventure game guy. I did enjoy some of the classic LucasArts adventures. Um, over at my buddy Greg's place, he had a Mac Power PC, and he had a handful of those LucasArts games, including Full Throttle, um, as well as... Um, of the Tentacle, and I think he had one of the Monkey Islands as well. I don't remember which one, though. Uh, the Matrix Online. Uh, that's... Did I skip a page here? Oh, I did. Okay, there you go. Um, 2004 
a review. It was the best of times. It was the... Actually, the times were pretty good. <laughs> um, what else do we have here? The best use of mushrooms lineage to... Oh my. This is... This is... I'm surprised that they're allowed to show a nipple in their magazine. I feel like that's... That was, this wasn't allowed, but they, there we go. Best argument against nudity. Singles flirt up your life. Second best arc argument against nudity. Leisure suit Larry Magnum come laud uncut and uncensored. Wow. All right. Yeah, I never played either of those games, um, but I do remember uh, the magazine poking fun at them. Um, best intro movie, World of Warcraft. Absolutely. Oh man, that that intro video is still a classic, despite not playing the game uh, at the time. I thought it was the coolest intro movie, and uh, it still <laughs> sends, you know, gives me goosebumps, sends shivers up my spine to this day. Like that music and that, those scenes. Uh, Blizzard has long been uh, just amazing with the cinematics. Bloodiest intro movie, yes. Dawn of War, the original Dawn of War, holy cow. Uh, fantastic intro movie for a different reason. Uh, just massive carnage of, with space marines in a great way and orcs. Worst intro movie, Vampire the Masquerade, Bloodlines. Yikes, I don't think I ever saw that one. Best roadblock to PC gaming, Steam. <laughs> The future of games distribution is here, and so far, it sucks. I love it. I love it, guys. The best roadblock to PC gaming, and here we are, almost 20 years later, and Steam is the great enabler of PC gaming. You know, uh, Gaben had a vision, and uh, it took him a while to get there, and obviously others involved too, not just Gaben, but they got there in a way that no one could have possibly imagined, like to a degree and scale that no one could have imagined. So funny to look back in hindsight and see stuff like that. Best graphics in the dark, Doom 3. Best graphics in the daylight, Half-Life 2. Fair, fair. Best value, UT 2K4. The best mod, Red Orchestra. Right. That was um, uh, a crazy World War II, like Eastern Front mod, I believe, for uh, UT2K4. Very cool. Matrix Online. Never played it. Always kind of interested, but it didn't live that long. I think some people really liked it, though. Cell Chaos Theory, which I did not play, but I think it was pretty well received. I do think it's a shame that Ubisoft hasn't done anything with uh, Splinter Cell for so long. Dark Age of Camelot, another MMO that was uh, known for its unique like realm versus realm combat, big open PvP battles, um, which... Uh, I was always kind of interested in, but never did play. Here we go. This is what we're here for, guys. Living in oblivion. The Elder Scrolls 4. Welcome to the new RPG. With 2002's The Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind, Bethesda Softworks perfected the hybrid of role-playing game and first-person shooter. Perfected, eh? <laughs> okay. Now, with Oblivion, the desperately awaited fourth installment in the Elder Scrolls series, the developers are raising their game to an unprecedented level. This was not an in-game screenshot. This was some kind of render, but... So... I do remember some of these screens. Yeah, this is a classic. I absolutely remember that one. Um, I remember this one with the deer. Uh, I'm not gonna read 
uh, all the text here because uh, that would be quite a bit but hell busts loose obviously the Daedric invasion of Tamriel there played not made let's see, let's read a little bit Todd Howard Bethesda's Elder Scrolls guru and producer on Oblivion says that the kitchen sink was thrown into the sequel but he minimizes the efforts of design, saying he puts the emphasis on experimentation at the working alpha stage. My motto is, great games are played, not made, says Howard. You design something on paper and spend three pages on it, and then you build it and players walk right by it. The best features are usually happy accidents. You didn't even know it was a feature until people started playing and had fun with it. Um... Yeah, I mean, that's that's very much uh, a staple of, of modern game design, as I understand it, the concept of, you know, getting a playable alpha as soon as possible, and then um, playtesting, tinkering, experimenting, iterating, 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 um, finding the fun in your systems. Uh, you know, I think there are many strong proponents of that these days. Um, this alien ruin looking amazing at the time. <laughs> this, this angry looking troll. So one thing that really struck me about this screenshot uh, when I first saw it was actually not the troll at all, but over here, you see, you see that, that shiny surface. You see those specular highlights on that surface. That was mind-blowing at the time. You see how the surface looks all pitted, like you can see the reflections, but then there's all this like wear and like pitting in the floor. Unbelievable. Uh, such a thing did not exist uh, prior to that, as far as I know. In terms of like uh, the detail of surfaces, uh, it, it certainly blew my mind at the time anyway. Um, I guess it was bump mapped. I guess they were bump mapping that surface there, probably. Again, that foliage, just that unbelievable foliage. Um, you might notice that uh, there's a lot of a lot of lighting going on and a lot of bloom. That was certainly one of the uh, standout features of Oblivion at the time. It had a very high fantasy, uh, bloomy kind of aesthetic, which was novel at the time, but would sort of come to define that era of games in a lot of ways. Sort of the Xbox 360, PS3 era had a lot of very bloomy, soft-looking games. It says here, real-time dynamic lighting adds to an incredibly rich 3D engine. It was pretty remarkable, honestly. Oh, that's all we get. Uh, I was really hoping we would get more. So this must not have been the episode where they debuted the screenshots because again I uh, or the issue I should say that debuted the screenshots because I remember a, a specific series of screenshots uh, that just blew my mind at the time but these ones were pretty good I was so desperate for anything about Oblivion uh, these are reviews oh Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay actually supposed to be quite good Hey, they gave it 93%. I guess that's pretty solid. Never played it, but people still speak fondly of it. Great looking game for its time, too. Prince of Persia, The Warrior Within. I think this one, uh... Yeah, <laughs> was not, not especially well received. Uh, I never played it. I feel like Prince of Persia, maybe that's due for another kick at the can. It's been a long time. Demon Stone. That was an old D&D game. I did not play it at the time, but I believe I do own it. I think I got it as part of a D&D &D bundle on GOG once upon a time. Apparently it was alright. Vendetta Online, an MMO for the space pilot on a budget. Doesn't seem like it was super well reviewed. The Stronghold Games, Build and Manage Castles. Weirdly, I did not play them, although they would have been right up my alley. Hearts of Iron. Uh, that's one of those OG Paradox uh, games. Um, there you go, Developer Paradox Interactive. This would have been, I don't know if it's their 
first, or one of their first uh, forays into grand strategy anyway. EVE Online, Exodus, uh, a Galactic Civ expansion, which sounds like they didn't think brought enough new stuff. Sonic Heroes, 50%. I don't think Sonic Heroes was especially well liked. Medieval Lords, 30%. Savage, like the Middle Ages. It's nasty, brutish, and smelly. Oh, savage. NRA Varmint Hunter, 7%. I always love it when they did these gag reviews. Back in the day, there were not nearly as many games coming out. Like, we have just so many games coming out all the time today. Um, you know, but in indie dev wasn't really a thing at this time. Indie games weren't really a thing. So PC Gamer could take the time to review these, you know, this shovelware like this. Um, and uh, oftentimes those reviews were absolutely hilarious. Hunting games hit a new low. <laughs> it begins, don't buy NRA Varmint Hunter. I don't care if you're the world's biggest hunting game fan. I don't even care if your family was killed by a pack of rabid gophers and revenge is your only obsession. I've played flash game advertisements that are more fun than NRA Varmint Hunter. <laughs> Savage. Absolutely savage. Save me, Pita. Save me. Also, this Giga Chat over here. This is like... Uh, like sexy Squidward meme worthy. Scrabble online. Alright. Apparently it was okay. CSI Miami. Uh, 62%. Sure. Star Shatter. Don't know that one, but a shooter RTS. Kind of looks neat. TMNT2. Oh, 15%. Rough. I don't know what was wrong with it, but that's not good. And then, of course, we get to the hard stuff. This is the section where they talked about all. PC gaming hardware of the time with Greg Viederman and the feed. <laughs> he was a bit of a personality, a bit of a goof. Um, I don't know what's become of him either. I have no idea if he's still in games media. Probably not, but. And then they would list out the three different PCs an entry level system, mid range, and dream. You can see the dream level system really was a dream. It was like four and a half thousand dollars and two thousand five dollars. That's whew, that's uh that's heady. That's, that's quite something. But just for funsies, I like to look through and see what kind of specs we're talking about here. Let's look at the CPUs. So entry level system, an AMD Athlon XB twenty five hundred plus. Um, in the mid-range system, a 3200 plus, an Athlon 64, 3200 plus. Later that year, that is exactly the CPU I would get in my first gaming PC. Probably based on this recommendation. In the Dream system, Athlon 64 FX 55. These were, of course, all single core chips at the time, I believe. Eventually, the FX line did end up with some dual-core CPUs, as did the Athlon XP line. The Athlon XP 3800 Plus, I think, was dual-core. But that was the very, very beginning of multi-core computing, in the mainstream at least. 60 gigabyte hard drive for entry level, 120 for mid-range, 400 gigabytes for uh, the dream system. What about video cards? The Radeon 9800 Pro. Like I said, at that time I was rocking a 9600 XT, but that card was, I think, a couple years old by that time. So, 
The 9800 Pro seems like a solid entry level option. The G4 6600 GT, the G4 6000 series, was actually somewhat maligned at the time. My buddy, the one where we went and checked out Doom 3 at his place, uh, he was rocking a 6600 GT. Uh, the Ultra System, a pair of 6800 Ultras, so that would have been NVIDIA's top card at the time, and of course SLI was a big deal back in the day, running two cards in parallel, so SLI 6800 Ultras, that was the kind of thing that dreams were made of. Um, this uh, would have been a little before, I think, the launch of the Radeon X800 series, um, so but uh, when that series came out, it was generally quite well reviewed. Um, it performed competitively and was well priced, so that's why I went with the X800XL for my build. All kinds of other good stuff there. You notice the monitors they recommend, they're all CRTs. CRT, CRT. We hadn't really made the switch to flat screen LCDs yet. Uh, they did exist at this time, but they kind of sucked. They had bad colors, they had super poor pixel response time, so motion was often really blurry and uh, just not great for gaming. So CRTs remained the recommendation, even at the Dream System level through 2005. Um, I want to say like, 0708 that probably began to dip in favor of LCD panels. All kinds of fun stuff. USB mouse recommendation, the Razer Diamond back. I did eventually get a Razer Diamond back. It was a good mouse, but the left click died on me eventually. <laughs> Review of a, oh, a six thousand dollar system from Voodoo PC. Six thousand dollars of two thousand five monies, but uh, the aesthetic at the time very much into the UV reactive uh, water cooling and that kind of stuff. Um, I never went that route in any of my builds. I always just used air cooling, but I remember. You know, being uh, just uh, enamored with the, the the look, the aesthetic of all that UV reactive piping. It was very cool at the time, okay? <laughs> Here we go. What kind of frame rates were we getting? This is with the, uh, the dual SLI. This must have SLI 6800 ultras, right? Yeah, it does. So with SLI enabled, uh, Doom 3 at uh, 1280 by 1024, which was a 5x4 resolution. That was kind of the de facto, um, like, high-res gaming at the time. 1080p wasn't a thing. Widescreen wasn't a thing. Um, 116 or almost 117 FPS. Now that is actually a pretty modern kind of frame rate. The concept of playing games at 120 FPS back then was... Uh, um, pretty, well, I don't want to say unheard of, but uncommon. And, um, of course, uh, displays like CRTs, um, they, uh, would generally top out around 60 hertz. I don't think there were any 120 hertz CRTs, at least not at that resolution. So, um, you know, you would, if you were running at those frames, you'd have to live with screen tearing, basically or V-Sync and locked to 60 FPS, right? Splinter Cell, 83 FPS. Halo, 113 FPS. Or at 1600 by 1200, which that was an even crazier resolution. And uh, a lot of CRTs didn't even support 1600 by 1200 or above. Um, getting 102 FPS. Far Cry, 74 FPS. That's quite, quite the kingly rig at that time, but that's what, that's what $6,000 would buy you in 2005. All these ads for 
what is this cyber power? I buy power. I love, I just love the early 2000s PC aesthetics. I should really try and build like a vintage one of these. Like I still have my old PC from 2005, but the, my case was not nearly this extra. It was just a very boring black case, just a budget thing. But oh man, like <laughs> this looks like a transformer. The bright green, bright yellow was definitely a thing at the time. Ninety-five percent for that Rage SLI machine. They also really like these GigaWorks Pro Gamer G500 speakers. Logic Logitech X52 uh, Hotas. Funnily enough, or I guess this was SciTech at the time, not Logitech. Yeah, SciTech, but. Logitech bought SciTech many years later. Funnily enough, I actually have a system that's not too far off of this one. The X56. It's a similar kind of uh, design anyway. But uh, a bit more modern. Extended play, looking at mods. Dark Forces Demo 2 for Jedi Academy. The first three levels of the original Dark Forces have been ported to the recent Jedi Academy engine, right down to the original interface, music, and cutscenes. This mod recreates the levels as they were meant to be played, i.e. no lightsabers or force powers, but you can add these features via cheat codes. That's cool. I actually never knew that existed. How to build a scenario in Roller Coaster Tycoon 3. RCT3 was an interesting game. I played it a bit. It had its fun moments, but it was quite a departure from RCT 1 and 2. And um, it never really took my place, took their place in my heart. The Bard's Tale. Did not play this one, but we have a busty barmaid coming with a beer and a bunch of loot behind her. I think they're going for a, a certain vibe with this ad. There were a lot of tacky ads in, through this time period. You might have noticed. Uh, as I said, it was, a, it was a different time. A different time indeed. Gamer 
Gary went on to have a, a screenwriting career. Um, he was formerly editor-in-chief of PC Gamer way back in the 90s. They got him to write these backspace columns every once in a while, um, you know, in the years following. But yeah, uh, Gary Witta um, wrote um, the screenplays for uh, a number of successful Hollywood films. Book of Eli is one of uh, earlier one that comes to mind, but um, he actually uh, co-wrote the script for Star Wars Rogue One, which is to this day one of my, probably my number one favorite of the modern Star Wars films, you know, the Disney era films, so kind of fun. Anyway, uh, Gary Witta here says, uh, just when he thought he'd escaped Gaz, as he was called, or is called, I don't know if he still goes by Gaz ever, but is sucked back into this dizzyingly addictive MMO, MMOG, MMOG, Mamog. Next month, a worldwide exclusive announcement. I can't remember what it was, but Psychonauts, Vampire the Masquerade, Bloodlines, and more. Of course, the Coconut Monkey. That was their mascot, the Coconut Monkey. And uh, an ad for Kodor 2 and Walmart at the end here. And that, my dear friends, is the March 2005 issue of PC Gamer Magazine. <laughs> My stomach is really telling me it's time to end this. I gotta go get a snack, you guys. Um, hey, I hope you enjoyed this. I really hope that you had fun with this, whether it was a trip down memory lane for you, or whether it was a fascinating look into the past of PC gaming. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. This is a wonderful nostalgia trip for me, and, uh, um, it's just really like, it gives me the warm fuzzies to go back through these magazines and, uh, you know, bring back these old memories. Uh, I used to love these things. Like, I just look forward to them arriving in the mail every month. So, thanks again for joining me. I hope you found it tingly, relaxing, and interesting as well. And I look very forward to having you back here next time. Farewell for now, my friends. Hey, whoa, um, sorry, sorry to bother you, but, um, do you know about this channel's supporters? You don't? Okay, well, I, I can't have that. I have to tell you about them. They're amazing. Uh, look at all these fantastic people. All these amazing folks support what I do here on this channel very kindly on my Patreon or on my YouTube memberships. And there's one particular tier, the Fusro Da tier. Yes, that one right there. That gets a very special spoken shout out in each of my videos. And you're about to hear their names right now, starting with Drummer Brit, Black Tooth Bob, Jake Lofney. Rango Steel, Angel Garcia, Captain Vanquisher, Ragnar Ragnarsson, Dragoon88, and last but not least, James C. What a fantastic group of folks, and did you know that you could be one of them? Yeah, it's true. Crazy. There are links down below in the video description where you can check out both my Patreon and my YouTube memberships and see what kind of fun exclusive perks you can get at different levels. Make sure you check it out if you're interested, and once again, a big thank you to our amazing supporters.